Good morning. Our first song is God of Our Fathers. Before we go to God in prayer, we'll sing Faith of Our Fathers. Let us pray. Our Lord God Almighty, we come before thee in the name of our Savior Jesus Christ and thy Son, 
acknowledging that thou art the only one all-powerful who makest the things we see and the things invisible who give us light and darkness and the pleasures of this life and all the beauty that the hand has laid out before us and the love and grace that thou hast given us and the strength of our being to allow us to be here this day. We thank thee, dear Lord, for this congregation of thy people. We thank thee for the love that we show each other and for the talents that we each individually have that makes this congregation a strong congregation. For our elders and our deacons who have rule over us, for our teachers and our preachers who prepare lessons, for those who make cards and use their talents to upbuild people and to strengthen people and we pray that they will continue to use us that we can be the examples to this community as we all. And Lord, we pray for our, the sick of this congregation, for Sister Saber Gafford and those who will be mentioned at the end of this service. We pray that thou will watch over them and heal them and comfort them as only thou knowest they're in need of. Dear Lord, we're mindful of the lost of this world and, and those who are entangled in the pleasures of this world that Satan has laid snares to deceive. We pray for our own families, dear Lord, as we struggle with our children who have named thy name and have put on the name of Christ and have been tempted and have left thy church and returned to the world. We pray for our young families who are raising small children who have got to deal with the influences of the schools that they have attend to have to avoid the, the doubt that they're being taught of God and the doubt that they are and take away that put doubt in their, their minds of even what they are and to confuse them and to put doubt of the Almighty God. We pray for their strength that they can look to thee in thy word, that they can teach their children what God says. And we pray that we all can stand steadfast in the influences that is taken over our government, the evil that is taken rule over us, dear Lord, we pray for our country. We pray for the, the people that their minds will be opened and they can make the decisions to return to thee and this country may re return to the basis on which it was founded. Dear Lord, we pray for those who are in war-torn countries, for the innocents lost, and for the evil that has taken over them, and we just pray for our congregations there, and we pray that we can use our abilities to influence them and to care for them as we can. 
we pray for our first responders who are struggling against lawlessness, who lay their lives down for our safety, who have been targets. We just look at the news every day, dear Lord. There's a, we lose our law enforcement, and we just pray that thou will watch over them and keep them safe. Dear Lord, we pray for our soldiers, wherever battlefield they're on. We just pray for that they'll keep them safe and they will return home to us. Dear Lord, we know all things are laid open naked before thee. We know it's appointed unto us once to die and after this the judgment. We will appear before the judgment seat of Christ and give an account of the things we've done in this world, the things we've spoken, and our thoughts, whether they be of edification or deceit. We know, dear Lord, it's a fearful thing to fall in thy hands. And we pray that we all will examine ourselves as that we can be the Christians that we ought and be the influence that we ought. We pray that we'll use thy wisdom to be the examples in this world. We pray, dear Lord, that thou, that we'll live in pre preparation for that great day and that thou have mercy on our souls. We pray that thou will go with us to the fourth portions of this service. May all things be done in according to thy word. In Christ's name we pray, amen. Before the Lord's Supper, we'll sing this song. Let's go to God in prayer. Dear, most gracious, loving, heavenly Father, we come before you now 
as we have this opportunity to gather around your table and remember the sacrifice of, of your son. Lord, we thank you for sending Jesus to live the perfect life, the perfect example by which we should live, the perfect sacrifice of his body that was beaten, bruised, torn, adorned with a crown of thorns, and ultimately hung on the cross for our sins. Lord, I pray that you be with us now as we partake of this emblem that represents Christ's body. Pray that we examine ourselves, examine the lives that we live, the actions that we involve ourselves in, examine our, our thoughts, Pray that we separate ourselves from any earthly matters right now as we remember Christ's sacrifice. As we partake of this emblem, pray that we do so in a worthy manner unto you. In Jesus' precious and holy name, amen. Let's pray. Lord, we come before you continuing this prayer as we have the opportunity to focus on the blood of Christ that littered the streets as he was beaten, as he was mocked, the blood that trickled from his forehead as the crown of thorns was driven into, into, his, uh, into his forehead, the blood that that dripped from his body and littered the, at the foot of the cross. Lord, that blood was shed on our behalf so undeservingly on Christ, but he did it for us. He did it for us willingly. Lord, I pray that you be with us now as we partake of the fruit of the vine, which represents that blood. Lord, we examine our lives examine ourselves and never take for granted the loss of blood on Jesus pray that his blood ever be cleansing us from our sins and as we partake of this cup may we do so in a worthy manner unto you in Jesus precious and holy name amen
before we give up our means, we'll sing for the beauty of the earth. Let us sing. Let's pray. Dear Lord, we come before you yet again as we have this opportunity to give of our means, to give back to you a portion of our wealth and our, our material blessings that ultimately do come from you. Lord, we thank you for everything that we enjoy in this life. Lord, we are so undeserving of the comforts and conveniences that we enjoy. Lord, we pray that at this time as we have the opportunity to, to give back to, to you, that we do so willingly and joyfully and not of necessity. Lord, we pray that we are able to use the funds given today to expand the borders of your kingdom, to bring more lost souls back to you, and to grow the faith in this area and in the world where we might support missionaries and so forth. Lord, again, we thank you for everything that we've got in this life. We thank you most of all for the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross for our sins. In his name, amen. The scripture reading this morning comes from Psalm chapter 112, verses 1 through 3. Praise the Lord. 
Blessed is the man who fears the Lord, who delights greatly in his commandments. His descendants will be mighty on earth. The generation of the upright will be blessed. Wealth and riches will be in his house, and his righteousness endures forever. If you'd like, please stand as we sing Victory in Jesus before Brother Mark's lesson. <laughs> I Good morning. It's good to have this good crowd here this morning. It's always good to have visitors with us. We're glad you can be here. and want you to come back and be with us at every opportunity you have. Uh, it's good to be here today. We have a lot of opportunities coming up as well, not just for our Bible classes and worship services, but don't forget the summer series on Wednesday night. Um, I know David Phillips is looking forward to being with us this Wednesday night. In a couple of Wednesday nights on the week of the 4th, we'll have another singing and devotional as well. Um, come and be part of that. Vacation Bible School the, begins the third Sunday in July. A sign-up sheet for that, and let's be praying for it and inviting others to come. And also the second Saturday in July, the community breakfast. Um, we help Inner City do a community breakfast, and it went well, and we want to do one in our community also. Not only encourage people to come, there's signs that are put up in the community. We have flyers that we can invite people. It's a free breakfast just for people to come and eat and enjoy a uh, good fellowship together on a, a Saturday morning. But if we invite people, we need to come as well. So 
whether you, you know helping to serve or to cook or bringing food, but also to be there to eat together with those of the community. We're part of the community as well. Let's, let's take part in that and be praying for the success as well. But opportunities to be involved, things to be praying for as well. Today is the Lord's Day. We're here to worship God, but it is also a day that's designated Father's Day. And we give honor to those to whom honor is due. And we do indeed honor and praise those who are godly fathers and grandfathers and even great-grandparents as well and for who they are and for the good work that they do. You know, fathers a lot of times take a, a, a lot of kidding, a lot of jokes about them. Some of it deserved, others maybe not so, so much deserved. I think a lot of times husbands have a bad reputation when it comes to getting gifts for wives. Uh, I heard about one man that just didn't quite get it. I mean, he gave his wife an iron for Mother's Day and she was not pleased at all. But he finally got the point, come Father's Day, she gave him an ironing board. And he finally got, kind of got the, got the point at that point. One little child went in to, do, to turn his homework into his teacher, and she was grading the paper during class, and she looked at him and said, how can one child, how can one person, how can one person make so many mistakes on one paper? And the child said, it wasn't one person, my daddy helped me with it. So again, then there was the, ch the father who, they brought home a newborn baby, the first baby, the, the father and mother did. And the mother changed the first couple of diapers, and then she asked her husband, do you want to give it a try to change, to change this diaper? And he goes, I'm busy right now. I'll try the next one. Well, a little bit later, the child had a wet diaper, and she said, honey, you said you'd try the next one. And he goes, oh, I didn't mean the next diaper. I meant the next child. Uh, you know, sometimes husbands have that type of reputation. Fathers do as well. And again, maybe some are that way. We joke about it. But godly parents, godly fathers, godly mothers are indeed a wonderful thing. And I, I know that many of us have been blessed with godly parents in our lives. If not, hopefully you have been godly parents and we encourage, we honor those that are godly fathers. I want us this morning for just a few minutes to talk about fatherhood. And I want us to look at one example in the Bible. It's maybe one we don't normally think of when we think of looking toward a father. And yet it was a concerned father by the name of Jairus. Usually we go to people like Abraham that stand out and you look at people that are, are great characters that much has been written about. But in Mark chapter 5, we read the story of Jairus and how he was a concerned father. And I think there's some lessons for us. Not a lot said, but a lot is said. In Mark chapter 5, verse 21, when Jesus had crossed over again by boat to the other side, a great multitude gathered to him and he was by the sea. And behold, one of the rulers of the synagogue came to him, Jairus by name a ruler of the synagogue. They would have a person who was kind of in charge of the synagogue as far as the physical things were concerned. I mean, they'd make sure that everything was maintained and clean and in its proper place. The scrolls were taken out carefully and replaced carefully. They would many times line up the order for when they assembled together for the, the worship assembly. They'd line up the order and make sure, you know, who was going to speak and what, what would take place as far as prayers and different things were concerned as well. And so a person that that was respected, a person that was trustworthy, that had an important job to do, came to Jesus. When he saw him, he fell down at his feet and begged him earnestly. Here's a man with great responsibility, a man that would be honored and respected, and yet he was humble enough to fall down at the feet of Jesus because his daughter had a need. His daughter was sick to the point of death. In fact, she dies during the story as well. But he, he begs Jesus. My little daughter, she's 12 years old, lies at the point of death. Come and lay your hands on her that she may be healed and she will live. You see the faith that he has. If you'll come, she can be healed. If you'll come, she will live. So Jesus went with him and a great multitude followed him and thronged him. And then you have kind of a, a different story take place where the woman with the issue of blood comes and, and, and all of that event transpires and the discussion there. And during that discussion, in verse 35, while he was still speaking, some came from the root of the synagogue's house who said, Your daughter is dead. Why trouble the teacher any further? Can you imagine that father there at this point? He's, he's there desperate to get Jesus to come, and then the word comes back, she's passed away. You know, it's too late. Don't trouble Jesus anymore. As, Je as soon as Jesus heard the word that was spoken, he said to the ruler of the synagogue, Do not be afraid, only believe. Now here you are, you've come from the, the, the hope, to hopelessness. And when Jesus says, don't be afraid, only believe, you kind of wonder, what in the world is he going to do? But you follow him. He permitted no one to follow him except 
Peter, James, and John, that inner circle uh, of the disciples. And he came to the house of the ruler of the synagogue and saw a tumult, and those who wept and wailed loudly. I mean, that was a common occurrence in, in Jewish culture was for a lot of people to cry and to weep. Sometimes they would even pay people to do that, but you can imagine the multitude here, somebody that's respected, their child is lost, and they're weeping, they're wailing out loud at the loss that took place and the sadness that was there. And Jesus came in and said, why make this commotion and weep? The child is not dead, but sleeping. And they don't understand maybe who he is or what he's about to do. They ridicule him. You know, you don't know what you're talking about. How can you say that? Maybe you're trying to be comforting. That's no comfort to give false hope to someone. You know, the, the child is not dead, but sleeping. But he puts those ridiculers out. He puts that, that commotion outside. He took the father and the mother of the child and those who were with him and entered where the child was lying. He took the child by the hand and said to her, Talitha Kumai, which is translated, little girl, I say to you, arise. Immediately the girl arose and walked, for she was 12 years of age. A great miracle takes place. He raises her up from the dead. And they were over, overcome with great amazement. And you can imagine great joy as well. But he commanded them strictly that no one should know it and that something should be given to her to eat. A great story of a great miracle of Jesus. I mean, the power of Jesus not only to calm the storms, not only to feed the multitudes, but to raise up the dead. I mean, it shows the great power that Jesus had over life and death itself. But there's something more to the story as well. You can see something in this man, Jairus, the ruler of the synagogue, as far as his faith in God is concerned, as far as his being a concerned father was concerned as well. What can we learn from the, the lesson, some of the lessons we can learn from Jairus and from his example? First of all, he rose above peer pressure. Think about it for a moment. Here he was, a ruler of the synagogue. And you look at many of the rulers of the day, whether on a lower level or especially the upper echelon, you look at the Sanhedrin, and some of those did not like Jesus. They were jealous of him and his followings. They didn't like the teachings that he had. He called them out on occasion. They, he was not the type of Messiah they were looking for. And pressure was put on those of any kind of leadership position not to have faith in Jesus, not to follow after him. And they understood the implication. I mean, some of those that believed, like Nicodemus, he came to Jesus by night, perhaps not to be seen or to tell you for sure who Jesus was. Now later, at the death of Jesus, you see him coming out to the forefront and helping with his burial. But you, you see some of these that were pressured not to speak up, not to speak out, not to stand out. And yet he came to Jesus. Not only did he come to Jesus, he fell at his feet and begged him earnestly. That showed great faith in Jesus. Jesus, look, you're my only hope. And maybe it was desperation. Maybe it was that, you know, what can I do? My child's about to die. I'll do anything. I'll go to Jesus. But it showed that he understood Jesus was the answer. That when nothing else could work, Jesus would make it work. Jesus could heal her. Jesus could make her live. And so he rose above the pressure to conform, to give in. He realized there was a great need there that was more important than whatever pressure around us might be. And, you know, we look at our children and need to understand the important obligation that we have with our children. And we want the best for them in so many ways. And yet, what about spiritually? I mean, we, we live in a society that puts down um, certain spiritual standards about right and wrong, about good and evil. We have a society today that has rewritten the book as, to far, as far as morals or lack thereof is concerned. Uh, and they glorify in things that they should be ashamed of. And the pressure is there not to speak up, not to speak out. The pressure is there not to train our children the right way and teach them the right thing, but to give in to society around us and help them to conform to society. No, he rose above the peer pressure. He, he came to Jesus. And we need to rise above whatever pressure may be that's keeping us from becoming a Christian to become a Christian. Or whatever pressure may be there to keep us from living the Christian life to live the Christian life. Whatever pressure may be there to keep us from bringing up our children properly to set the right example before them and bring them up in the right way. He rose above that peer pressure. And then he brought his daughter to Jesus, or really brought Jesus to his daughter. I mean, you, you look at the situation there, he understood the only hope that his child has was Jesus. Without Jesus, she had no hope. What do we give our children? You know, I, I've read the articles and the, the count down the list and all, of how much we spend on our children from the time they're born until they leave the home, if they leave at 18 or 22 or some longer than that or whatever it may be, in the tens of thousands or even hundreds of thousands of dollars that we spend on our children to bring them up and to get them ready for the world. 
and, and that's well and good. I mean, it's good to give our children food, clothing, shelter, the necessities of life, and even um, some extras along the way as well. But sometimes we spend so much time trying to make sure they're properly educated, make sure they're, they're not only properly clothed, but have the best of everything, to make sure that they fit in with everyone around them and, and maybe even have a little bit more than them. We, we're very concerned not only about necessities, but the luxuries. You know, it, it amazes me when children go out into the world today, they want everything their parents already have. I mean, you think about the parent; they want it now. But you look at those parents, when they first got married, they didn't have a lot. They had to work their way through their life to get to the point where they have the house they have now, the possessions they have now, the, the cars or whatever it may be that they have at this point. But children want that when they first start out. And many times parents want that child to have that when they first start out. And that, that becomes the, the most important thing and, and the goal that's there. Again, we, we have to feed our families. We have to take care of them. But the most important thing in life is to seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. To love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. To love your neighbor as yourself. To put those things into practice. Christ is number one. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by him. He brought Jesus to his daughter. That was the only hope she had. And we need to bring Jesus to our family by being a Christian ourselves, by setting a, a Christian example, by bringing them to services, by teaching them, by studying together, by leading them to Christ, by bringing them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Someone has said to give your ch children a knowledge of Christ is the greatest blessing that you can give to them. He also had time for his daughter. I don't know how much time on a day-in, day-out basis he spent with him, but in this story he had time. Time to go and to chase down Jesus. Time to fall down at the feet of Jesus and beg him. To do everything he could to bring Jesus back to him. How much time do we have for our children? Again, you have the pressure of work trying to get you away and keep you busy with the work. You have your own recreational activities and other things you may want to do. We get so consumed with the cares of this life that maybe we don't take the time that we should for our children and even for our grandchildren or you can go great-grandchildren if you will as well. He had time for the daughter because he understood she had a tremendous need. It was life and death, and the only answer was Jesus. And we need to make sure that we have time for our children as well. <clears throat> Back in an unrelated story in 1 Kings chapter 20, there was a servant in the middle of a war. that There was a prisoner of war that was taken, and the servant said, you watch this servant. At, at, it'll be your life if he gets away. You know, it's life and death. You watch this servant. That's your job. Well, this, the, um, excuse me, this, this um, prisoner... The prisoner escaped, and the servant was being held accountable. And 1 Kings 20 and verse 40, the servant said, While your servant was busy here and there, he was gone. You know, I got busy. I got tied up. You know, I have a lot of responsibilities here. And before I knew it, he was gone. We can get busy here and there, and before we know it, our children are grown. Our children are gone. He had time for his daughter, and he took the time to do what was needed. And ultimately, the daughter needed Jesus for life. Evidently, there are no other answers, no other way. I mean, she was sick, she was dying. In fact, she does die, and then Jesus gives to her life. And especially after she died, what other hope did she have other than Jesus? He understood she needed Jesus above anything else, and he went and got Jesus and brought Jesus to her, and Jesus <coughs> was able to give life to the child and restored her back to good health once again. You know, you look at that story, and there's a lot of lessons for us as well. We, we have needs in life, a lot of needs, food, clothing, shelter, those things are important. But the greatest need that we have is Jesus. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. In John 5, 39 and 40, Jesus looked at those people and said, look, you're searching the scriptures because you think you have eternal life in them. And they do offer eternal life, the words that are there. But he said, the scriptures testify of me, but you're not willing to come to me that you may have life. Jesus says, you're missing the point of everything. It's, it's Jesus, it's Christ. You know, he's the way, he's the truth, he's the life. You can't go to heaven except through Jesus Christ. And that daughter needed Jesus in her life to give her physical life. We need Jesus in our life to give to us eternal life. You think about all the things that we provide for our families. But we provide for our families the one thing they need more than anything else, and that is Jesus. Can they see Jesus in our life? Can they see us as Christians? Can do we share with them not only the example, but the teachings of Christ as well? You look at Jairus. Oh, he rose above the pressure of the day to, to come to Christ. He came with faith in Jesus 
that Jesus could help him. And he brought Jesus to his daughter because that was the greatest need she could have. He had the time to do what was needed. And she received what she needed most in life, the healing hand of Jesus. Again, it may not be about physical healing, but it may be about spiritual healing in our life as well. We look at the example of Jairus, and there's great lessons for us today. What about us? Can we rise above whatever pressures are keeping us from becoming a Christian or living the Christian life to obey the gospel? Perhaps you need to be baptized into Christ this morning. Have your sins washed away in his blood. Don't let any pressure from outside or inside keep you from doing that. Come to Jesus. As a child of God, are we putting first and seeking first the kingdom of God? Or perhaps we need to make our lives right. But let's bring Jesus into our life and then bring it to the life of our family members as well. Take time for what's important in life. And realize the most important one of all is Jesus Christ. Perhaps you're here this morning and need to respond to the Lord's invitation. Whatever need you may have, why don't you come while we stand and while we sing. first and last stanzas of America. <laughs> 